drop down to verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He says here that, that Jesus is saying to the disciples is that there is such a thing as a heavenly father. You know, our earthly attempts at being everything that everyone needs us to be are going to fail sometimes. And we just, we're not perfect. We're not sinless. And so as much as we try, there will be times when we fall short. And yet what we do have here is we have a heavenly father. And he says that he's preparing a place for us. He's preparing a home for us. He has a heart of compassion and love for us. And um, even now, Jesus was reminding them that, that as I leave you and I ascend to heaven, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit who is going to be your helper, your spirit of truth, your guide. He's going to be with you always. He's going to be in you, and he is going to father you throughout the rest of your life. For those of you who may not be aware, my wife and I started a ministry 15 years ago to um, high-risk and fatherless youth. It wasn't something we planned to do. I'd been a youth pastor for about 20 years. Most of that was in um, Indianapolis, Indiana. And so, but one morning, my devotions, God was um, stirring my heart about some things. And so that morning, I was reading through Psalms, and the Lord spoke to me about, um, like, all the youth in our city that we were just not reaching in our church. We had, you know, we had about 100 teenagers in our church youth group, but, um, and I was really happy in this role. And had been doing it for a really long time. And yet there was something convicting that started uh, swelling up inside of my heart. I kept thinking about, well, while this is wonderful, but what about all the teenagers that live in Indianapolis, Indiana, who have never been to church, who don't have a Christian mom, who don't have a Christian dad? We haven't reached them. We, we haven't even scratched the surface there. So what about, what about them? And so that morning I um, felt really compelled to just go and do some exploring and so I drove on a whim to the Marion County Juvenile Detention Center in Indianapolis. I didn't really know anything about it. I didn't know anyone there. I didn't know anybody that worked on staff. I didn't, I didn't know any teens that were there. And I just walked up to the front door and just banged on the door and asked to come in. And there was a police officer standing inside, metal detector, weapons, everything. And I guess I hadn't thought this through very well that, you know, you just don't walk into a criminal justice facility off the street. It was about 10 degrees outside in the winter. And uh, so I started um, explaining to this officer why I wanted to come in. And I basically said, I spent about 10 minutes um, persistently, pleasantly, persistently talking to him. And he kept saying, why are you here? And I said, well, um, I'm a youth pastor in the community, and I was just wondering if I could come in and talk to someone who works with ministries about some of the spiritual needs of the youth here. And he looked at me like I had lost my mind. And he said, why, okay, but who do you want to meet with? I said, well, I, you know, I don't know. I'd like to meet with the person who uh, coordinates with ministries in the community uh, just to find out more about the spiritual needs of the youth. And again, he, he got really irritated with me, and he said, all right, so do you have an appointment? No, I don't. So if I let you in, who are you here to meet with? And I said, well, like I said, um, I'm just wondering if I could talk to the person. So he leads me into the building, takes me to a, a station, and mocks me by saying to the next person, this guy, what did you say your name was? I said, Ken Turner for the 10th time. And he said, he's here to talk to, he goes, the person who works with ministries in the community. He looks and he says, is that right? I said, that's right. So he, he, they hand me off to a lady about, now I'm about five or six locked doors inside. And we sit down in her office and I explained to her, I said, you're going to think this is crazy, but this morning I was reading in my Bible and God spoke to me and said, I just need to come and ask, do you need anything? Do you need anything? She says, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I have a lot of things in mind, but I don't even want to tell you that. All I want to know is, do you need anything? 
She said, like what? I said, just any, do you need anything? I, I mean, if there was a youth pastor in town that could help in some way, is there anything that you need? And this is what she said. And this is how God tricks us, okay? He tricks us. He has this humor that he tricks us into things. And, and she said, well, here's what I need. I've been to churches all over the inner city. I've been to African-American churches all throughout the inner city. I've been begging for someone to come in and do this one thing. She said, There's, there are units here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, um, and the F unit has 16 boys in it, and for several months they have been begging me, could you find a man that lives in the community that could come in and have a Bible study with us on a weekly basis? Because this is what, this is what they said. These were their words. A bunch of 15, 16, 17-year-old boys locked up. 16 guys in one room. They've been begging me. She said, I've been to all the churches in the inner city, and the response I've gotten is this. Those boys are in trouble. They deserve to be locked up. They need to understand that there's a price to pay for the choices they've made. So we're not going to come down there and try to, you know, pamper them. We're not going to come down and try to help them. And she said, nobody's interested. She said, but this is what they're asking of me. They said, we don't know how to walk like a man, talk like a man, how to treat a woman. We don't know anything about manhood because none of us have a father. And so what we would really like is if someone would come here and sit down with us and just teach us from the Bible, what is God's purpose and what is God's plan for us as young men? So she looks at me and she says, they want to call it the Man Up Bible Study. This was in 2008 when Man Up wasn't, you know, like everybody wasn't saying it. It was kind of a new thing. And she said, they want to call it the Man Up Bible Study. She said, can you do that? And I said, um, well, when are we going to start the Man Up Bible Study? And she said, Monday night from 6 to 7.30. But you have to go through a process and you have to get cleared you have to have your you know background check and all that stuff and I said she said it might take you know several weeks I said that's fine so I go through the process and it took a little longer than you know I thought it would take and and so the first night I was on the schedule to come in after all that waiting and preparing and I walked in with really nothing more than just a bible and I'd been a youth pastor in a big a big church of a thousand people and where everything was like this, you know, everything was so clean, everything was so nice, and uh, most of the teenagers in our church youth group, you know, were born into Christian homes, they'd been in the nursery when they were little, a lot of them were even children of parents who were Christian college graduates, so, so that ministry was, you get the picture, pretty, pretty clean and pretty organized and orderly, so I walk into this unit and there sat 16 boys in a half circle in plastic chairs and orange jumpsuits. And they didn't, they didn't look anything like me. And uh, I didn't grow up in the inner city. I don't know if this surprises you, but I didn't grow up in the inner city. And I wasn't in gangs, and I didn't have any of that background. And you would look at me, and you look at them, and you would think, which some people told me later, they did think, what in the world is this guy doing here? What does he have to offer? He has no idea how to relate to this population. And I sat down in a chair in the middle of this half circle, and I just opened up my Bible, and I just had a Bible study. And, you know, the weird thing is nobody said anything. I, I went through uh, Scripture and shared with them. Um, I don't even remember what it was that first night. I just had a very simple Bible study. And, if, and during the Bible study, nobody, nobody said anything. Nobody talked. Nobody had a question. And at the end of the Bible study, I'm looking at them, and I mean, they were very attentive. They looked and, and just paid such close attention. And at the end, I said, guys, let me pray with you. We bowed our heads, and I prayed, and I picked up my plastic chair, and I carried it over to sit against the wall. And as I turned my back and walked toward the wall, one of the boys spoke up for the first time, and he said, thank you so much for coming here tonight, and God bless you. And I turned around and I said, well, thank you, and, and, and you're welcome. And then another boy spoke up and said, yes, thank you so much for coming. And then two or three of them started clapping. And then they started clapping and they jumped to their feet 
and they started clapping faster and louder and harder. And this went on. Everybody in the room pretty much turned into a standing ovation, kind of like what we do for Mick at the end of all church services, right? So, so they all stood up, and they started clapping loud and fast, and it just went on and on and on for like two or three minutes, which you know as well as I do, that two or three minutes in that environment, that felt like a half an hour. I thought, this is never going to end. And in my youth pastor days, the teenagers never gave me a standing ovation at the end of my sermons or lessons. So, you know, this was, this was new, right? This was new to me. So all that happened, and then they sat down, and I'm still kind of headed toward the door, and one of them said, you need to make us a promise. I said, okay. They said, you need to promise us that you're going to come back. And I said, well, that's easy because I am coming back. I, I said, I'm coming back um, like, like in a few days. I was already on the schedule. And they said, no, 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 no. You, you need, you don't understand, you need to promise us that you're going to be back here like, next week, and I said, I'm, I'm actually coming back next Monday. They said, no, you need to promise it, and I said, okay. I didn't understand then. I do understand this now, what was going on, and I said, okay, I promise you, I promise you <laughs> that I'm coming back, and I'll be here Monday at 6 o'clock, and they said, no, but you need to promise us that when you come Monday at 6 o'clock, that you will come in this room, and that you will teach us in this room the Bible and what God has for us. And I said, well, I just said that. And they said, well, you know, there's, there's units, you know, A, B, C, D. They said, those people up there in the front, when you come in, sometimes they might say, well, tonight we're going to put you in unit A or B or C. And they said, we need you to promise us that you'll be here Monday night at 6 o'clock in, in unit F. And I said, okay. I'm going to be here Monday night at 6 o'clock, and I will continue to come back week after week in Unit F with you and nobody else, just with you. And they were happy with that answer. And so the next week, I came back. And we continued to connect and study the Word of God together. And I started experiencing something that I had never experienced in my entire life. And this is what... I can't tell you what I taught them, but I can tell you very clearly what I learned from them. I realized after a while that I'm sitting in a room with uh, high school boys who are fatherless. And there is, there is um, something about growing up fatherless. And the void that happens in life, but it doesn't have to be this way, and there is an answer to this, and it's found really in the fatherhood of God. And God's heart of a father, he really doesn't have fatherless kids. And that's one thing that drove me back into the scripture. And I started doing a deep dive into what does the Bible say about God as a heavenly father. And what does the Bible say about anyone who grows up fatherless. And so today is Father's Day. So it's it seems natural that... On a day like this that we are thinking around the word father and fatherhood. And we're also very aware that we all have a father story. And that father story for some of us is wonderful. And that father story for others is not wonderful. My mom was the youngest of nine children. And her father story is that her mother died when, when my mom was a nine-month-old baby. So my mom's mother died when she was nine months old, and her father died when she was around nine or ten years old. And so my mom grew up being raised by a stepmother in a very, very, very difficult environment. And my dad's father's story is that um, his father wasn't really his father, and he, he didn't know that till a little bit later into his childhood, and his um, father, uh, his biological father, he never knew, and his stepfather was my grandfather was a very distant very very distant father and so based on the father story of my mother and my father you know in our family even though I'm in the ministry it's not because I grew up in a you know the perfect mixture of all the family dynamics 
you know, there were barriers and there were struggles with connecting with one another because of this, you know, when you grow up a certain way, it's sometimes difficult to emotionally connect with your own children and, and in your own family. And so, so we went through that. And so I'm sitting now in a room with a room full of teenage boys who are all fatherless, and God began to reveal something back to me. And that is that all of my life up to that point, I had never fully understood God as my heavenly father, as a loving heavenly father, as a father figure who really was there to meet all the needs and care about me in ways that I had felt huge gaps. And so at this point, I was in my 40s, and I'm starting to realize some things I'd never understood before, is that, you know, at moments in life when you feel alone and you feel fatherless yourself, that you are not alone, that you are not fatherless because God is a heavenly father who takes care of us, he cares for us, he guards us, he guides us, and he protects us and provides for us in ways that we don't fully understand. And so today, whatever your uh, father's story is and whatever your uh, circumstances are, I want you to understand this one thing, that God wants to have a personal relationship with you. And he wants to be your father. He wants to be your heavenly father. And he will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you alone. He will never leave you to fend for yourself. He will always be there to guide you and protect you and watch over you and care for you. He will shine the light on your path. He has wonderful plans for you, bigger than anything you can imagine. And God, as a father, is here for you. And he will be with you all the way till the day he calls you home. And that's wonderful news. And so as I began to um, really dig into Scripture on what does the Bible really say about God as a father figure, I'm going to boil it down to three things because that's what you do in a sermon, right? You do three things. (laughs) And so so here are the three um, truths that I want you to understand about God as a father and even God as a father to the fatherless among us. First of all, is that you are in his heart. You know, when you look at John 14, he starts out talking to us about what he is doing for us. He says, verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. You don't need to be full of trouble and anxiety. Believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house, there's many mansions. I'm, I'm there, I'm preparing a place for you. And I'm going to come again and bring you to myself. And he assures the disciples that I am here for you. The Holy Spirit is, is, is going to be provided to you. He's going to be here as your helper. He's going to be here as a spirit of truth. He's going to be here um, to just constantly be in pr- his presence is with you and inside of you. And you will never, ever be left as an orphan. That God has promised these things. And if you were to take... The, the term father of God, fa- the fatherhood of God, fatherlessness, and you were to go from the Genesis to Revelation, you would start to notice that there are certain patterns and teachings that could kind of be uh, incorporated together and, and encapsulated into these three truths. And here's the first one, is that you are in his heart. In Exodus chapter 22 and verse 22, let me share this verse with you. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. How do you think that God feels about his fatherless children? He is very territorial toward us. His spirit of protection is very strong. And he says in Exodus 22, verse 22 through 24, that if anyone were to mistreat a widow or a fatherless child, he says, and they cry out to me, I'm going to hear their cry. My wrath will burn. My anger will be kindled. He says, I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. You don't mistreat one of God's children. He has a spirit of protection. He, he is territorial over us. Secondly, we are in his heart, um, is that he has tremendous concern for your problems. 
He has a spirit of protection, and he has tremendous concern for your problems. As a matter of fact, James 1.27 reminds us, religion that is pure and undefiled, undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unstained or unspotted from the world. God is very, very concerned and has a protective spirit over us, but he's also concerned about our problems, and he wants others to be aware and to be in ministry to help address those problems and lighten the load. So his heart toward us is a spirit of protection, concern for our problems, and provision for our personal needs. Number three, Deuteronomy 14, 28 says, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns and the Levite because he has no portion or inheritance with you and the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. So God's heart for you is a spirit of protection. He cares deeply about your problems and he is willing and desires to provide for all of your personal needs. That doesn't sound like a fatherless child to me. That sounds like a person who has a father, a heavenly father, a perfect father, who doesn't mess up like we do as, as earthly dads, but a heavenly father who cares for us in many different ways. He protects us, he helps us with our problems, and he provides for our personal needs. I don't know if you have ever been to that point where you just could not meet all of your personal needs. I don't know if you can relate to being in that scenario where there just isn't the resources. You don't, whether it's um, the wisdom, the, re, the resource of wisdom, I don't know what to do. The resource of money, I don't know how we're going to survive. The resources emotionally, mentally, um, I, I'm not equipped for this problem. I'm not prepared for this. I can't do this. I can't withstand more. And yet God is here. He is your heavenly father. And he cares very deeply about being a provider. He, he is a provision-making father. There was a time when we started this uh, ministry <clears throat> 15 years ago that things got kind of tough. And um, there, were, there were several days... Uh, actually months, okay, years, <laughs> where we were just trying to get it off the ground. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. And there were times when I would just pray and pray that God would provide. I had no idea how we were going to get to the, the end of the week, to the end of the month. And, and, you know, you've heard these stories, right, from people in the ministry or people not in the ministry, people that are just trying to follow the Lord and things are not always working as they thought they would work. And I remember one uh, one day, just being really concerned about, like, we need to get to the grocery store, and yet the bank account is very, very low. And, and, uh, and some people from our church just sort of on a whim, unannounced, showed up at our front door with some boxes of food, and they just said, hey, we, we just felt compelled to do something for you, and um, here are some few boxes of groceries. And, you know, I don't know if they realized how critical things were becoming and that the timing of that was amazing. And, you know, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but when it does happen to you, that is a huge faith builder. And so that did happen. And then there was the time when uh, the, the bills were due and, you know, nothing came. And so I'm thinking, wow. I mean, like, really, Lord? You want to embarrass yourself like this and not pay your bills? I mean, I mean, what's going on here? Did you not read the due date? And yet, sometimes... It just is not working the way you predicted that it would work, and yet you, here you are, here I am, and we're okay, right? We got through that, and God took care of it, maybe not in the time frame that we thought, but he took care of it. I need you to know this this morning, is that God, God is saying to you that whatever you may have experienced in life up to this point, as a father, you are in his heart. His heart for you is strong, it's deep, and it's powerful. 
there's no question, there should be no question in your mind, although I know there are questions sometimes. But Satan would love, if there's anything he could do, he would love to deceive you into thinking that God, God's heart for you is less than his heart for someone else. That God doesn't, somehow God doesn't care about you the way he cares about someone else. And that is the lie that Satan would love to drill into you because there's probably a lot of sins that you and I will live the rest of their life, our lives, and never commit. I mean, Satan knows that. Like, um, I could live the rest of my life. I'm probably never going to rob a bank. Uh, well, not probably. I am, I am never going to rob a bank for those that are recording. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not probably, probably never going to rob a bank. I'm never going to rob a bank. I'm never going to murder a person. I'm, I'm never going to do things like that. I just, I'm not going to do that. But what I might do, what I might be susceptible to do, is to fall into a trap of starting to believe that God's heart for me is not the same as his heart for someone else. And that's where Satan knows that he can kind of dig in. Because if he can affect your view of God as a loving Heavenly Father, he can create in you a spirit where you will stiff arm God and you'll do it for a while. Days could turn into months, which could turn into years or even decades, where even as a child of God, you keep God at a distance because you're not fully convinced that his heart for you is the same as his heart for someone else. That's one of the lies that Satan would love for you to believe. So as a father, you are in his heart. Secondly, if I went through all of Scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And the other thing that stood out through verse after verse is that not only are we in God's heart, but we are in his hands. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 64 in verse 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. We, are all, we all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and you have made us melt in the, hands, in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter, and we are the work of your hands. Not only are you in God's heart, but you are in God's hands. In this way, he is molding you as clay. God is shaping you and molding you. When you were born, you were born just the way he wanted you. Study Psalm 139. It's powerful. One of my favorite chapters of the Bible. That when you were being formed in your mother's womb, as it says, in the dark places of the earth, in secret, which is actually in the womb of your mother, in secret, before your mother even really knew that she was pregnant. Remember, like when your mother said that one day she opened the refrigerator and looked at food and something weird started churning <laughs> inside of her. It's like, man, that was where did that come from? Well, you know, before your mother even knew that you were there, God in the secret place of the earth, God was already forming you, shaping you. He was determining that you were going to be tall or short, that you were going to have blue eyes or brown eyes, and you were going to have ten fingers and ten toes, and that you were going to have a loud personality or a, a shy personality, and God was forming you in your mother's womb. And yet, when you were born, we were not born sinlessly perfect. We immediately start sinning, right? Any of you have a baby or a kid in the house? There are a bunch of sinners in that house, right? So when they, when they walk into church and say, oh, look at that he, little angel, you know, those of us who are pastors want to go, no, that's not an angel, <laughs> you know, but because uh, we're all sinners from the very beginning. And yet, after we were born and we were made exactly the way God wanted us to be made, he created you for a purpose, he continues to mold you in his hands, and he is the potter, and you are the clay, and and he has formed you, and he is forming and shaping you. And the things that happen right now, in the, in the, the good and the bad, 
He's using it to shape you and mold you ongoing into this progressive sanctification of the child of God that he wants you to be. And that really will never stop until we go to heaven someday because we're always a work in progress. So he's molding us with our, his hands. Another way that he works with us with his hands is that he makes us secure in his hands. John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. So not only are we being shaped in God's hands, molded into the person that God wants us to be, but we're also protected in his hands, that he is, he is holding us in his hands. God doesn't drop his kids. God doesn't fumble the football. God never, ever, ever looks down at something unexpected that happened, and God doesn't say, oops, <laughs> you know, he never, he never says that. He never stops and says, oh my goodness, I forgot that they were traveling, you know, through that intersection today. I forgot that they were going to run into that person today. I forgot that that was due today. God doesn't ever have those moments. He is always with us, wrapped in his hands. So we are being molded by his hands. We are being protected by his hands, and he makes us secure. And with his hands, thirdly, he also hands us opportunity. Sometimes the same hands that are molding you and shaping you and the same hands you know, that are protecting you and holding on to you are the same hands that he will hand you an opportunity and he will give it to you and the freedom to steward that and do with it what you will for his glory. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you, it will be handed to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, one who seeks finds, those who knock, it will be opened. Which of you, if his son seeks, uh, ask him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to them who ask of him? God will hand things to you. He will give things to you. He will take his hands as your heavenly Father, and he will hand you opportunities. So the fatherhood of God looks like this. You are in his heart. You are in his hands, and lastly, he has a place for us. You have a home in heaven. And that takes us back to John 14. John 14, verse 16 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, which will be with, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. God is providing for us a home in heaven. And there's, there's, uh, there's three things I want you to think about this. Because God has now promised us that we're in his heart and we're protected by his hands, this is while we're here, but there's something more that's coming in the future that one day we're going to be home with him and we're not home right now. You know, we're kind of aliens here. We're just pilgrims passing through. We don't fit in. Do you ever feel like you don't fit in? In this, in 2023, do you feel that you do not fit in? <laughs> because I don't fit in. And I'm finding myself more and more realizing that I don't fit in. I feel like sometimes I say things, I feel like I'm a hundred year old man. Like, well, you know, back when we were growing up, you know, we, we had the, you know, we did this and we just understood that. And, and we, you know, the world is changing drastically. In the last three to five years, three to five years ago, if you'd have said, this is going to happen in three to five years, we would have all said, there's no way that we're going to advance, or I would say decline, that fast in such a short period. Well, that's because this is not our home. Really, it's not. We're aliens. We're just pilgrims passing through. Take comfort in this. Not only are you in his heart and hands, but our home is somewhere else. And he says in John 14, he is preparing that place for us. And, 
And just to wrap this up, there's three things he wants you to do while we're waiting. Be comforted. In verse 16, 17, and 18, he's like, do, do not worry. I will not leave you as orphans. Um, I'm preparing a place for you. Be comforted. Be connected. In John 15, 1 through 5 is the, I am divine. My father is the husbandman. To abide in him, believe in him, rest in him. Be comforted. Be connected. And then see John 14, 1 through 4. Just be ready to come home. Because one day we get to do that. And when you get to go home one day, in an instant, all of the battles, all the struggles, all the worry and anxiety that you might have felt this week, it's just not going to matter. As soon as you see Jesus face to face, as soon as you are home in your real home, your eternal home, everything is going to take on a whole new perspective. <clears throat> one day, I was in the juvenile center and during the Bible study, a teenage boy began to cry. Now, it probably won't surprise you that in this environment, there aren't too many boys that cry. Like us men, we don't cry, right? <laughs> so so we, just, we don't cry a lot. And in this environment, it's extremely unusual that a, a high school boy would just start to cry. But this boy started to cry and so much so that he really couldn't get it together. So we got up, and he went to his room and locked the door. And we continued on. And then another boy, at one point, started to cry. And he, he tried to bring it together. He, he just couldn't, so he got up and he left the room, and he went up some stairs, and his room was up top, way off to the right. But he left the door open, and he, I could hear him sobbing. And so when the Bible study ended, um, I asked the security guard, I said, is there anything I can do to help? And she said, well, this boy that went over there, I know what's going on, and he's fine. Um, he's had some things today that, you know, have just caused him to be sort of emotional. But she said, the, the young man that went upstairs, she said, um, I think you need to go talk to him. And so I went upstairs. I had never been inside of one of their cells before, so I went upstairs, and I walked in, and and there's a, a steel bed and a toilet and a sink and a tiny little window. And I sat down on the side of the bed with him and I said, um, you know, is, is there anything I can do? And he was crying so hard that he couldn't even really talk. I mean, he was, he was you, know the, you know that moment where, you know, you're, your sorrow is so deep that you can't talk. You're, you're just trying to breathe. That's where this kid was at. And he was just, it was everything he could do just to keep breathing. And so I put my hand on his shoulder, and it was like I had laid my hand on a rock. And I realized that his muscles, uh, his muscles and his body was so extremely tight that from, from the anguish that he was experiencing, that it was like literally, it was like touching a rock. So I just put my hand on his shoulder, and, and I said, um, when you're ready to talk, I, I'm ready to listen. And, you know, after a few minutes, he began to say a few words, and he said, um, I don't have anybody. And then I realized, well, it's December, so maybe because we're getting close to Christmas, this might have stirred the emotions a little bit more. I don't know, but he said, I don't have anybody. <clears throat> and I said, okay, I understand that. And I said, you know, a lot of the boys here have told me that they don't really have a father in their life. So is that what you mean? You don't have a father? Uh, because I understand that. And a lot, of, a lot of guys are kind of in that situation. He says, no, I don't have anybody. And I said, okay, well, uh, I mean, a lot of the boys have told me that, you know, they don't have a father and they don't have a mother either. But their grandmother, she's been there for them and she's been there from day one and you know, when they go home, they're, they're going back, and Grandma's going to take care of them. And I said, so is that what you mean? And he said, no. he said, no, I don't have anybody. Well, now I'm kind of stumped. And, you know, when you're, when you're a pastor, you don't want to say, okay, well, I don't know what to tell you. See you later. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I was a little stumped. I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. So, all right, so you don't have a dad, and your mom's not there, and your grandmother's not there. And I said, 
all right, well, let's talk about this. I say, when you go home, um, so, you know, everybody's got somebody, right? So there's a, is an aunt, uncle, uh, older brother, older sister. Um, who is that? And he, now he's talking and he says, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I don't have anybody. And I said, well, wait a minute. Everybody has somebody. Everybody has somebody. He said, no, I don't have anybody. I said, so aunts, uncles, older siblings, where did you live? He said, well, I lived with this foster family, and they said that they don't want me to come back there. And so I literally do not have anybody. And I had a social worker tell me one time that they had called 20-something relatives and had gone 20-something relatives deep into one young man's family and had yet to find one person that the state of Tennessee at that time would consider um, capable or, or worthy or fit to be a guardian. And they had gone 20-something relatives deep and had yet to find one relative that would be fit to be a guardian of this young man. So when he said, I don't have anybody, what, what he meant was, if, in case you're still wondering, um, is I don't have anybody. <laughs> and so, so we went all the way around this full circle. And so now I'm really stumped. I don't know, what, what would you say? What do you say to someone? What do you say to a 15-year-old? And then it, then, it, then it dawned on me. His name was Isaac. And I said, Isaac, hang on a second. I said, wait a minute. A couple of weeks ago in the Bible study at the end, remember you came to me and you said you had some questions about how to have a personal relationship with God. And he said, yeah, I remember that. And I said, and we, you know, I showed you from the Bible and we prayed together and you prayed and you asked Jesus into your heart and you got saved, right? He goes, yes, I did that. I said, man, what are we thinking? I said, what, what are we thinking? I said, this is all wrong. I said, it's not that you don't have anybody. I said, you have God as your heavenly father, and he's going to father you for the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, God has already said so clearly all throughout the Bible that this is how he feels about his fatherless kids. This is how he cares about you, and this is what he will do for you, and he will never forsake you, and you will never be alone. And I can promise you this, for the rest of your life, God will be there for you. And not only that, he is going to provide for you surrogate dads. Now, how do I know that? I don't know. I just know God, and that's how he, that's how he does this. He, he will provide men in your life that will be like a surrogate father, and by the time you get to be my age, you won't ever be talking about how you didn't have a dad. All you're going to be talking about is how not only did God father you and parent you, but then he gave you like three, four, five fathers, which were there for you in every way, and they never, ever let you down. You're never alone. I said, that's the truth. You're, you're one of God's children. And he smiled really big. And he says, wow, I didn't think of that. And I'm like, yeah, me neither, but I just did. <laughs> and so here we are. There's hope. I said, we just need to pray, right? So we did. So I put my hand back on his shoulder, and I began to pray for him. And that rock-hard shoulder got softer and softer and softer, like mush, right? By the time we finished praying, I was, like, I was sitting next to a normal person who had no anxiety, no fear, no stress, no real worries. He was not abandoned. Now... I'm sitting next to a person who understands he has a heavenly father, and so do you. And, you know, God wants you to know today on this Father's Day that, you know, there's just no perfect fathers in here. We are trying. We are aspiring to be what God wants us to be. But the fatherhood thing, if you want, just, just to wrap this up, if you want a great relationship between fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, it really does go both ways. I've met some of the most amazing children and adults who grew up with really lousy parents. And I've met some um, really lousy young adults 
who grew up with the most awesome parents. How in the world do you explain that? Well, it's not really that complicated. Because the Bible says that every one of us must give an account of ourselves to God. So I've had a, my, my dad passed away a few years ago, but I've had a pretty good relationship over the years with my dad and a good relationship with my mom because I kind of think that God would be really pleased if I would just be the son that God wants me to be, period, not with all these conditions that if they did everything right. I don't think that's really what God is asking of me. And he's not asking that of you as a child toward your parents. He's asking you to be the son and daughter that he would be pleased with. And that's what it means to honor and respect your parents. And so when we aspire as parents to be all God wants us to be, and then we aspire as children to be the sons and daughters that God would to be pleased with, not expecting perfection or anything spectacular on either end, our families would be restored. Our relationships would be restored, and God would be very well pleased. Because think about it, as children of God, we really don't deserve the love and the care that I have just described to you. But God's going to give that to us anyway, because he is a loving Heavenly Father. Let's pray.